Press A to jump, a foundational building block of many games. For as long as players have taken control of characters with the capability, they have leapt across chasms, over pitfalls, and up obstacles. These days, it's more difficult to find games that won't let you jump, if given command over a single player character, and while some still search for ways to reach new heights with the mechanic, they have big shoes to fill. So, let's take a step back in time and look at how far we've come with jumping. Before we get started, I would like to quickly ask you to like the video and subscribe if you'd like to see more documentaries like this. That is the single best way you can show support for these projects. It lets me know what you want to see more of and keeps the algorithmic machines happy. And with that out of the way, let's get going. In 1980, back when arcades were the most profitable venture for the industry, Tokyo-based developer Universal released Space Panic. The title featured a main, indefinable character traveling from platform to platform with the use of ladders. Its goal to defeat each enemy on screen by digging holes, waiting for enemies to fall inside, and then filling the holes before an oxygen gauge runs out. Though it did not define the genre, this game has been credited as the first platformer. Just one year later, 1981, Japanese juggernaut Nintendo released their smash hit arcade game, Donkey Kong. Though the aesthetic similarities to Space Panic are obvious, Donkey Kong's design proves that this is only skin deep. The game stars Jumpman, who must travel from platform to platform with the use of ladders like his predecessor in Space Panic. However, unlike its forerunner, the objective was to navigate Jumpman to the end of an obstacle course. The first and most memorable board presents challenges from the top of the screen, where the titular great ape continuously throws barrels downward, passable only by jumping over them with a static arc. The height of Jumpman's bound was just enough to pass over any obstacles in the game, a perfect parabola. Any change in the jump would not feel nearly as satisfying. Physics were defied in 1984, when Namco's Dragon Buster was released in arcades. This game allowed players to double jump, which, as the name implies, began a new jump arc in mid-air. Dragon Buster wasn't able to innovate on the idea beyond its conception, though later titles borrowed and built upon the idea. Capcom's 1991 title Super Ghouls and Ghosts had a double jump with a steep learning curve, requiring the additional mastery of projectile weaponry to keep monsters at bay. Large chasms, a never-ending torrent of enemies, and minimal room for error earned Super Ghouls and Ghosts the reputation as one of the most difficult 2D platformers ever made. Designed to be a game with such a simple premise that anyone could enjoy playing it, Kirby's Dreamland let players jump indefinitely, avoiding enemies as long as they did not confront them. However, if you attack while in the air, you sacrifice your ability to jump further. Double jumping, as well as other offensive methods of recovery, would also become an integral mechanic in Nintendo and HAL's platform fighting game series Super Smash Bros., first released in 1999. The year is 1983, and Nintendo releases their first home console, the Famicom, in Japan, later followed by the westernized Nintendo Entertainment System in 1986. The deluxe set of the NES that hit store shelves came packaged with a copy of Super Mario Bros., a spiritual successor to Donkey Kong. This title was a massive leap forward, giving players a perfectly optimized jump that incorporated momentum, fluid controls, bouncing, and the ability to both affect the environment of levels and defeat enemies with nothing more than a fist to a block or a boot to the head. Nintendo's flagship franchise became a gold standard next to which all other games on their console would be compared. 1985 saw the release of Konami's Yi'ar Kung Fu, an arcade fighting game where players could take turns battling against computer-controlled opponents. Though it wasn't the first fighting game, it was amongst the earliest to feature jumping in its player character's moveset. As the genre moved forward into more competitive territory, jumping became an essential tool in keeping other player-controlled opponents on their toes. In 1986, Konami approached jumping with a drastically different angle with their action platformer, Castlevania, with players stepping into the boots of the whip-wielding vampire hunter Simon Belmont. The developers took a chance, giving Simon a static jump arc more akin to Jumpman than to Mario compensating for the subsequent limitations to movement with their level design. Though not completely devoid of traditional platforming obstacles, Dracula's castle greatly differed from the Mushroom Kingdom in that there were far fewer surfaces to be found in its long bridges and hallways. 
Instead, the challenge came in the form of enemies, all of which had to be defeated or dodged to move forward. Take for instance, the Medusa Head. A staple of the franchise, the heads float from one side of the screen to the other in a sine wave, continuing on whether or not they make contact with the player. They can be avoided in most cases with a well-timed jump, and while walking in a straight line dodging Medusa heads may not sound difficult, one mistake can cost the player dearly. Many titles flirted with combining the jump with other mechanics, with 1988's Metroid being amongst the first notable examples. Though earlier games could see jumping facilitate attacks, whether it be at the end of a jousting pole or by landing on the head of an enemy, Metroid's Screw Attack was one of the first examples of turning the act of jumping itself into an assault. The upgrade was powerful, and became a recurring part of the series' iconography and its heroine's moveset. Tecmo's Ninja Gaiden, also released in 1988, gave its protagonist, Ryu Hayabusa, the ability to cling to walls, which allowed for jumps to be strung together strategically as players navigated the title's challenging levels. The 1989 Disney Capcom classic DuckTales allowed players to take Scrooge McDuck's cane and use it as a pogo stick, bouncing atop the heads of enemies and across dangerous obstacles. In 1989, Rotor Bun's Jordan Mechner had players running, crawling, and jumping through dungeons in Prince of Persia. The animations of the game were referenced from videos of Mechner's brother, rotoscoped and then converted into pixel art. However, a side effect was that the titular prince's athletic abilities were confined to the realities and limitations of the human body. For example, if you wanted to jump any significant distance, the prince had to build up speed with a running start first, an early experimentation with realistic jumping in video games that makes for an interesting and memorable experience for the era. In 1991, Sega ran in the opposite direction, entering the mascot wars with Sonic the Hedgehog, a platformer primarily built for speed. Still, the blue blur took a cue from other games in the genre, using jumping as one of the player's primary attacks. Springs were also incorporated into its level design, functioning as both a vehicle for more complex puzzles for the platforming and to ratchet up the speed for certain sections, both horizontally and vertically. The mixture of jumping with other mechanics was perhaps first fully realized with Capcom's Super Nintendo title, Mega Man X. The dash boots found in the icy layer of Chill Penguin sped up the gameplay on the ground, but, when combined with a precisely executed jump, they also allowed for new ways to fly through the air. Still, it's possible to complete Mega Man X without ever performing a dash jump, but certain sections can be skipped entirely by using the ability. Another skill available to X was wall jumping, which provided a method for vertical travel without having to rely on slow-moving platforms or lengthy ladder climbs. As the fifth generation of consoles dawned, so did the ability to produce true three-dimensional environments for players to explore. In 1996, Naughty Dog released their own entry in the Mascot Wars of the mid-90s with Crash Bandicoot. Like the two-dimensional platformers that came before it, the objectives presented here were normally as simple as defeating enemies and getting to the end of a level. However, Crash Bandicoot offered a new perspective on the genre, moving the camera behind or in front of its titular hero allowing him to move in all directions. However, jumping in this game felt much like it did in the 16-bit titles of years gone by. Despite its charming simplicity, attractive graphics, and impressive design, it barely explored the depths possible with three dimensions. In 1996, Nintendo released their newest console, the Nintendo 64 developed from the ground up with 3D in mind, and amongst its launch lineup was a familiar face. In Super Mario 64, Mario moved more like an acrobat than a plumber, with wall jumps, long jumps, and even backflips all in his repertoire. However, the advancements made with this title reached their highest points with momentum. The longer he moved in one direction, the faster Mario would run, until he hit a maximum speed, which opened up the ability to triple jump. Quickly shifting Mario's momentum the other direction allowed him to perform a cartwheel flip jump, and while in the middle of a forward jump, the arc could be changed with a mid-air dive. These mechanics were surprisingly complex, offering both replayability for the casual and a very high skill ceiling for the hardcore. Super Mario 64 set a new standard for 3D platformers, just as its previous incarnations did for the second dimension. Many games followed the trail that Super Mario 64 blazed, whilst adding their own twists and turns. The 
collect-a-thon subgenre popularized by titles like Rareware's Banjo-Kazooie often included improved jumps as power-ups, allowing players to reach new heights and find additional secrets. Spyro the Dragon crafted a platformer designed around the ability to glide great distances, often across entire levels. Other games, like Nintendo's very own Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time, still struggled to completely get a handle on jumping in the new 3D environments. Instead, players steered Link towards a ledge and hoped he would cross the gap as intended on his own. These auto-jumps were more or less successful, and the Zelda series would refuse to lose control of Link's jumps to players until 2017's Breath of the Wild. 1996 also saw a massive leap forward for what could be done with jumps in the first-person shooter genre, with the birth of id Software's Quake. Though that title boasted an impressive single-player campaign, it was the competitive community's multiplayer matches that led this progress. Due to a technical oversight from the developers, forward momentum could be added to players who strafed and jumped at the same time, lengthening the jump arc and adding to their overall speed. Altogether, this formed a technique known as bunny hopping, which made the user more difficult to hit at the expense of more difficulty aiming, raising the title's overall skill ceiling. Quake also added an ability the community would dub rocket jumping, by aiming a rocket at the floor in the opposite direction of their intended trajectory and timing a jump correctly, the resulting explosion would propel the player much further and higher than any normal jump could dream of. Both techniques would become staples in the arena FPS genre, and would be supported by competitive players and the modding community alike. However, as time progressed, not much else new was done with the jump. The 3D platformers of the sixth generation, while critically acclaimed and commercially successful, experimented with other gameplay mechanics, while in contrast, shooters of the seventh generation aimed mostly for realism, where a jump would be practically useless. A notable exception to this was the Halo series, which puts players in the boots of elite Spartan super soldiers, allowing them to jump higher and farther than even a human at peak physical condition. These games took much more inspiration from the high-octane, vertically inclined, fast-paced shooters of the late 90s and early aughts, though the most extreme leaps within the Halo series, like super jumping and super bouncing, were more often the result of glitches than intentional design. Ubisoft's 2003 reboot of The Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time, turned that series on its head. The agility of the game's titular prince allowed for more incredible acrobatics, peppered with wall running and incredible jumping. The game's most iconic feature, however, was the introduction of a time control mechanic that let players slow time, freeze it completely, or reverse their mistakes if a leap was taken too blindly. Jumping was also still present in many RPGs of the era, but were mostly used for exploration purposes or included because it would not make for an immersive role-playing experience if your character was bolted to the floor. In some cases, as with Blizzard Entertainment's 2004 release World of Warcraft, jumping evolved into a way for players to amuse themselves during the long treks across their continent-sized game maps, though the MMO would eventually include jumping as mechanics in some raid encounters. It wasn't until 2007 that something truly new was done with the jump. Portal's premise, using realistic physics combined with the reality-bending portal gun, allowed for the jump capability of a normal human to be greatly magnified. When combined with the long fall boots, a clever bit of fictitious technology that entirely negated fall damage, this allowed for some truly amazing leaps across Portal's puzzle chambers. More than once, the only way for a player to progress involved jumping from a portal-inflated height and then infusing that momentum into horizontal or diagonal movement. Similar new puzzles were also implemented in the game's sequel, Portal 2, which also featured a gel that could be spread across walls and floors and then bounce players that jumped on it. In 2008, Electronic Arts released Mirror's Edge, a title where players found themselves in the shoes of Faith, a freerunner making her way across the rooftops of a dystopian society. Though seen through a first-person perspective, the gameplay of Mirror's Edge had much more in common with the 3D platformers of years gone by. Though gunplay was an option, the real challenge and fun came from using Faith's skills in parkour to move through the world and proceed through makeshift obstacle courses. Though not particularly a smash hit, Mirror's Edge was critically acclaimed and considered a trendsetter, and several titles followed suit, toying with parkour and free-running in their jump mechanics. 
Ubisoft's Assassin's Creed brought things back into the third person, as Altair scaled and then leapt from ancient buildings. Bethesda's Dishonored mixed jumping and parkour with magical abilities, while Respawn's Titanfall gave players jetpacks and wall runs to accent their jumps. Blizzard Entertainment's Overwatch was an orchestra composed from ideas and mechanics pulled from every corner of the industry, but jumping was a part of every hero's kit, and in many cases essential to their most useful abilities. Psionics even managed to incorporate jumping and flying into Rocket League, a vehicle-based sports game. Pretty much everywhere you look, jumping has found its way into every corner of gaming. It's a constant, a classic, easy to understand and get off the ground, yet with the potential for an impossibly high skill ceiling. Jumping is here to stay, and while we just have to wait and see how much further it can be pushed, I for one hope that we have only begun to see the height of what the jump can achieve. What other mechanics would you like explored in a documentary like this? Please let me know down in the comments below. And while you're there, please don't forget to like and subscribe and ring the bell so you know when future videos like this come out. Doing those things are really the single best way to show YouTube that you like this and you want more of it. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.